Good afternoon and welcome to today's local government education program provided by University of Illinois Extension. I'm Nancy Wadrago, Community and Economic Development Specialist for University of Illinois Extension. Today's webinar will cover a discussion about the critical elements of digital inclusion, including understanding the root causes of the digital divide, the power of digital inclusion coalitions and communities, and funding information. Presenters are from the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, NDIA. Um, we have Amy Huffman, who's policy director at NDIA, who has studied and worked in digital inclusion for 10 years. Uh, prior to joining NDIA, she served as the state of North Carolina's first digital inclusion and policy manager for the Broadband Infrastructure Office. So thank you so much, Amy, for being here and participating today with everybody and presenting your, your expertise. We also have Pamela Rosales. She is a training and community engagement manager at NDIA, and she specializes in digital equity advocates and provides digital inclusion 101 trainings. Before we kick off those presentations, I'm going to um, I'm very happy to set aside uh, my, um, the, the introduction now and um, welcome Matt Schmidt. He's the director of the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunities Office of Broadband. And we thank him for leading programs and efforts across Illinois in his role. Uh, Matt is going to give an update and remarks and welcome on our presenters. Um, again, uh, enter your questions as they come to mind, and I'll be back on to facilitate questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you and welcome, Matt. Well, thank you so much, Nancy. And as always, we really appreciate the collaboration between University of Illinois Extension and our Illinois Office of Broadband. And so uh, it's fitting coming out of the, the Labor Day weekend that we've got a webinar here on day one uh, talking about some great work in digital equity and inclusion. And so I can't wait to hear what uh, our colleagues from the National Digital Inclusion Alliance have to say, because folks, um, not to spoil things, but there's been a lot of progress made, particularly at the national level in funding and supporting state and local initiatives on digital equity and inclusion. And so now is a perfect time for, for communities to re-engage, uh, to dig deeper on their, their local initiatives, and in particular, look for opportunities for further collaboration, whether it's with the state or other stakeholders around Illinois. And so just to level set, um, folks who, who've joined these webinars in the past are probably very familiar with the work that we've done in standing up our Connect Illinois Broadband Grant Program. We'll have some additional news coming out on opportunities with round three of Connect Illinois in the coming weeks. Uh, in addition to that, really excited to just share with this group uh, the way in which we look to meet the broadband moment, the opportunity that the, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act has given our state and the country in uh, addressing the digital divide, filling in gaps, identifying those gaps, and putting the state in a really strong position to, to achieve uh, universal access to broadband that's affordable, uh, that, uh, that is high performance, and that's gonna meet the needs not just of today, but of tomorrow. And so our Illinois Broadband Lab collaboration with the University of Illinois and other higher education and nonprofit partners will be highlighted in the, the weeks and months ahead. And that's where a lot of our work is gonna do uh, and take place on the digital equity planning front. And so we might get into this a little bit in the webinar today and certainly in conversations moving forward. But in the year ahead, Illinois and states around the country will have an opportunity to engage in community-driven uh, and local digital equity planning and engagement, identifying gaps, uh, Right, uh, identifying local solutions and initiatives and trying to chart a path forward for taking advantage of historic federal funding, over $2 billion devoted to digital equity in the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act last year. And so I'll leave it there, but we're really excited to use today's webinar to kind of kickstart uh, a more ongoing conversation about digital equity and inclusion and how the state, how communities, uh, how stakeholders around the state can take advantage of this historic moment. So if you haven't signed up for our Illinois Broadband Connections newsletter, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at uh, who registered for today's webinar and, and make sure that you're at it. You can always unsubscribe at a later date. And also um, take a look at some of the programming that we've stood up, whether it's Accelerate Illinois, our Illinois Connected Communities Program. There'll be some more opportunities uh, with regard to digital navigators and skills building at the local level. There's a lot going on and now is the perfect time for folks to be engaged. And so with that, uh, Nancy, I'll pass the mic back your way and I really look forward to hearing from our, our folks at uh, NDIA. So thank you. 
Thank you, Matt. I'm going to turn it right over to Pamela. I uh, really want to thank her and Amy for being here and um, hope uh, helping to learn a lot. Awesome. Thank you, Nancy. And hello, everybody. Let me share my screen so we can get started. All right. Are we are all able to see my screen. Awesome. OK. Hello, and welcome to our DI 101. I'm so excited to be here. Um, first, we'll go over our agenda. So we're going to talk about, I'll give you a brief introduction to who NDIA is, if you're unfamiliar with us and the work that we do. Then we'll jump into going and discussing definitions when it comes to digital inclusion work. We'll talk about the barriers to digital inclusion, some key barriers, and then the solutions right after that. In the solutions, we'll highlight different programs that are doing the, the, the work so you can see them as examples. We'll talk about our digital navigator model and the program, as well as digital inclusion coalitions. And then after that, it will be over to Amy, who will talk about policy. And then we'll have a hopefully robust Q&A section where you can ask any questions. Um, and I'm so excited to be doing this with Amy today because um, it's it's truly lucky that we get to have Amy um, to, to answer any policy questions. This is both of us. Fun fact, I am actually based out in Chicago. I grew up in Huntley, Illinois, so McHenry County, went to NIU, so DeKalb County, so now I'm, I'm, I'm based here in Chicago. So um, if any of those words sound familiar, uh, reaches. I, I do miss meeting some folks back in um, like Woodstock area and DeKalb area and stuff like that. All right. So about NDIA, who are we? NDIA stands for the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, and we advance digital equity by supporting community programs and equipping policymakers to act. We are a nonprofit representing and serving over 850 organizations throughout the country in 48 states, um, working for affordable broadband, access to devices, and digital skills training and support. So we facilitate knowledge sharing forums, such as community calls, working group meetings, and our um, robust and famous NDIA community listserv, where people come and they um, they're coming to bring digital equity to their communities and they're sharing those challenges, successes and resources while also learning from other folks who are doing the same thing. And after learning from our community, we draw major themes from what we've learned and then we align our advocacy efforts with that. So throughout the presentation in the different um, pockets of digital equity work that we will be highlighting. I will also be featuring all the resources that are um, that NDIA has created um, based off these conversations that we've learned from the community so that hopefully you can access them and benefit from them as well. All right, so let's define some key definitions when talking about digital inclusion. Um, sometimes these terms are used interchangeably, but they each mean specific things. So let's do just a quick definition on that. The first one um, we have is digital equity. So this is what we call the goal, right? It's the condition in which all individuals and communities have the information technology capacity needed for full participation in our society, democracy, and economy. So how do we get there? And it's with digital inclusion. This is the how, the, the work. It's the activities necessary to achieve digital equity. And it's the work that you're all doing. We'll go into details in the next few slides about what these activities specifically look like. But um, oftentimes when we talk and do these presentations, some folks don't even know that they're doing digital equity work. They don't necessarily identify as digital inclusion advocates or practitioners. Um, but as long as you're doing anything within the realms of digital equity, so providing affordable broadband, helping with devices and literacy skills, then you are technically doing digital equity and digital inclusion work. All right, so if digital equity is the goal and digital inclusion is the work, what is the digital divide? And that is the issue. So it's that gap between those who have affordable access, skills and support to effectively engage online and then those who do not. So the digital divide disproportionately affects those who are already impacted by oppressive systems like racism, classism, age discrimination and much more. And because 
broadband isn't viewed as a civil right and utility for everyone to meet their basic needs. You see the digital divide impacting people of color, Native peoples, people with disabilities, and households with low income the most. So I love to make my trainings interactive. We're going to be doing a fun Jamboard, NDIA. We love to use Jamboard. So for those who are not familiar with Jamboard, it's essentially a virtual whiteboard. And here on the screen is instructions on how to add a sticky note, because you could add unlimited sticky notes on them. So when we put the link in the chat, um, if you go uh, the left module on the right, if you press on the fourth icon, um, that will create a new sticky note for you to write on. You can write on, um, you can write on your sticky note, put whatever you want on there and then press save. That will create a new sticky note and you can continuously add more. So um, I believe Nancy put it in the chat to access the, the Jamboard. Please let me know if you have difficulty accessing them. But the Jamboard activity, I want you all to think about this question. What prevents people in your community from consistently connecting to the internet and using it effectively? And take some time to answer that. And I will actually share my screen. So give me one second so I can share that activity. We can all look at it together. All right, hopefully we can all see my the, the Jamboard screen. Somebody wrote price. Absolutely, affordability is a big barrier and determinant. All right, I'm just gonna move it around. Oh, thank you for whoever's moving that around. All right, somebody wrote poor physical connections. Yes, the infrastructure, it might be outdated. It's not strong enough. It goes out when the weather is not sunny. And in Illinois, we know that's not always the case. It's not going to be sunny all the time. Um, reliability, yes. Cost of monthly subscription. Um, Kayla said, doesn't let me get into the gem board. It says too many people are on it. Oh, um, Kayla and anybody else who has issues with accessing the Jamboard, please feel free to put your answer in the chat as well, and then I can also read it from there so you're able to participate. Julie says, rural areas do not have updated service in place. Yes, low bandwidth. Price. So there's a lot of comments on affordability as well as accessibility. Education, that's a big one. You might not have the, uh, the, the folks might not have the um, digital skills to know how to navigate the internet, right? They have internet, but they don't know how to connect it on their device or, um, or really have fun with it. Chris says low bandwidth, affordability and accessibility, need of assistance. Kayla, thank you for that. Lack of training, yes lack of training, um, you know, throwing the device and throwing an internet at, at a community is not going to solve why they're not using the internet, right? Sometimes we just focus on broadband infrastructure or a device, so there's that missing element there. Kayla, yes, language barrier. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, if digital skills trainings are primarily done in English, but that not everybody in your community speaks English or they don't, um, they, their writing system is in a different language, it's going to be really difficult for them to um, utilize those digital skills training, whether it's in person or online, because of that language barrier. Jorge says, extractive experiences discourage their participation. Yes, um, the lingo can be the barrier. I'm reading, I'm going back and forth between the Jamboard and the chat because y'all Y'all clearly know. <laughs> and this is amazing. This is really great because sometimes people only understand the affordable and the, the, the internet piece of it. But we're talking about, you know, um, skills and language barriers as well as costs and devices. So that's amazing. Um, somebody wrote here, have no interest in accessing the internet. Absolutely, that's a big barrier um, that I hear from a lot of practitioners where folks don't feel like, there's no benefit to them. Um, there's no buy-in for them to have 
access or learn those skills. And sometimes that's totally fine. We're not here to prescribe the internet for people. Um, however, they might not know what the benefits are. So that's my, that might be a reason why they don't want to use the internet is that it might not have been marketed to them or they think that um, whatever their identities are, it, they're just not the target demographic for the internet. But as we all know, the internet serves everybody. It benefits everybody. Resistance to change, absolutely especially because the internet is constantly changing. It's constantly evolving. You have to constantly learn new things. Um, I mean, the iOS, I don't know when we're gonna have iOS 16, but upgrading that, we're gonna have to learn, you know, whatever new upgrades come with a, a software update, right? So is, imagine somebody who's starting completely from scratch where they're still learning how to use a keyboard. That might be really frustrating. Affordable devices, yes, things get really expensive really quick. They might not be aware of the programs that are out there that can um, uh, provide discounts. Donald says frustration with trying to learn how to use it, absolutely. Frustration with trying to learn a new skill as well as um, add that with having a unreliable internet and that's just gonna make somebody give up, right? You're trying to learn and then your internet's keep cutting off. Um, it can be very overwhelming. All right. Uh, the cost of having an unlimited subscription. Mm -hmm. And we'll we'll talk about ACP later. Um, okay, I think we can, I'm gonna go back to our slides, but thank you all for participating in this activity. Um, if this is going to be beneficial for you, you all you will have access to the Jamboard in case you know this is going to be useful for you when it comes to um, you know talking with your community members and your program of why digital equity is important. You have all these um, different reasons as to why. So let me pause my screen and then go back to the slide. All right. Hopefully we are all seeing my uh, back to the Google Slides. All right. So as we see, you know, there's many different types of barriers. Um, we talked about devices, internet connection, affordability, and um, skills and tech support. For Akila, yes, after, after the training, I will go through, I'll just see what was on the chat and then add them on there as well. So you all can have it all in one spot. Okay, so let's talk about digital redlining. Um, you might have heard that term. It's also an important term. It's discrimination by internet service providers when it comes to deployment, maintenance, upgrade, or delivery of services. Um, Irma, yes, the, the slide deck will be shared. So let's look at this map on the right. In 2017, NDIA, alongside Connect Your Community, conducted a mapping analysis of FCC broadband availability in Cleveland, and we found that AT&T systemically discriminated against lower income Cleveland neighborhoods in its deployment of home internet and video technologies over the past decade. So this picture shows Cleveland and the red are neighborhoods with high poverty rates, and the green is where the fiber enhanced improvement I'm sorry, fiber enhanced broadband improvements were made. And as you can see, the overlap does not is not there. All right, so let's cover the three barriers, three key barriers to digital inclusion. As um, I'm sure some of you know, there's, uh, it used to be the three legs of the stool. Now there's five, now there's much more, but we'll kind of focus on the three key ones. So the first one is broadband inequity. Um, which a lot of you all brought up in our activity. As we all know, many households still do not have access to the internet. And it's important to understand that just because broadband, um, that infrastructure is available to a community, that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody is going to use it or adopt it at home. And um, this is because broadband availability is not the same as broadband equity. And broadband equity, it's achieved when all people and communities are able to access and use affordable, high-speed, reliable internet that meets their long-term needs, whatever that is, whether that is working from home, going to school, um, you know, connecting with their doctors through telehealth, or simply browsing and um, going on Netflix, right? All of those things are equally important. All right, so the question here, and you could put in the chat or just answer to yourselves, if everyone had access to fast and reliable internet, would that solve the digital divide? And the answer is no. 
There are other barriers that we talked about that needs to be addressed in order for people to get used to the internet and use it in the way that they want to. So another barrier that we talked about is um, affordable, adequate, and appropriate devices. So looking more into accessibility, because when we see here with the screen, adults with disabilities um, have, uh, they own 62% of devices compared to the 81% of adults without a disability. So looking more into accessibility, smart homes connected to smart devices like speakers, refrigerators, and thermostats helps people with disabilities have more autonomy and control over their daily actions. So to tackle this barrier, devices have to be affordable, adequate, and appropriate. So affordable just so that everybody can have access to these devices, adequate because you need to have a device that works well and are up to date. And I'm sure, um, especially for us who are working at nonprofits, I'm sure you know that just because something is affordable doesn't necessarily mean it's efficient or um, the right thing for the task. And appropriate because each device has its strengths and weaknesses, and we're going to be going through that in a few slides. And then another last and final barrier that we'll talk about today, but there's much more, is digital skills. So remote work. I'm sure you've all know because of the pandemic and everybody, you know, working from home, well, most folks working from home, it's demanding, it's driving the demand for digital skills. And so digital skills can financially improve someone's life, but outside of a job, having digital skills also allows folks to check their balance on their credit card, deposit a check without having to go to the bank, knowing how and where they can pay their medical bill online. Um, and same thing with in terms of telehealth, it's you know accessing medical charts or knowing how to schedule their appointments online or uploading important documents. All right, and here are some more additional barriers. Language access, somebody had mentioned that during the activity. So yes, for folks who are limited English proficient, um, learning how to build your skills can be overwhelming when everything is in a different language. Um, if imagine you don't have the digital skills and you want to learn, but you are going to a training facility where everything is in Arabic and the, the trainers are uh, training in Arabic, it's gonna be really difficult, right? So that's the reality for a lot of our, our folks in our communities. Another one I wanna talk about is fear and lack of trust, which somebody highlighted. This is a really big barrier um, that practitioners are up against, sometimes even bigger than um, some other things that we would assume, like not having a device, um, because people have legitimate fears about the internet, such as, you know, is their information safe? Will they get hacked, um, identity, identity theft, things like that, especially if they're seeing on the news that bigger organizations are, you know, their information is getting hacked, they might think, okay, well, what about me? You know, that's an organization who has so much money to, you know, protect themselves, what about me? And yes, Kila, identity theft is real. So um, people might not know the benefits that the internet brings. They might be overwhelmed and scared. Um, and they also have some thoughts of, I've gone this long without the internet. Why do I need it now? Right. All right, so here are the three solutions that we like to focus on. Um, and that is affordable broadband, appropriate and affordable devices and digital skills training. So let's go over each one. All right, so um, a brief, brief definition on broadband. Broadband is when um, you have connectivity that is strong and often that is a wireline that comes into your home. And the FCC, the Federal Communications Commissions, defines the minimum standard for broadband speed to be 25 megabits per second for downloading and three megabits per second for uploading. However, that was defined in 2015. And best believe, seven years later, those speeds are not enough. So, for example, if we have a home and there's three to four people in the home, um, there's about four to six devices connected to the internet. So think laptop, tablet, um, smartwatch, gaming consoles, or other um, even telehealth devices that need to be connected to the internet. Um, you have two folks that are either working from home or taking classes simultaneously. You're streaming videos in HD, um, and you're also playing video games occasionally. You're actually going to be needing 100 megabits per second for downloading, not 25. So that is um, those speeds are not sufficient when we think about our families. 
um, who are low income. Um, and there are more than one or two kids that are online, um, you know, going to school, it's, it's not going to be enough for them. And broadband adoption is another term. It's access to the internet at high speeds, quality and capacity necessary to accomplish tasks that folks want and need. Um, it's also with those digital skills necessary to participate online and on a personal device and secure convenient network. All right, so before we move on to our next um, barrier that we'll talk about, I do have a trivia question. And um, Nancy, you did play this when we were together in St. Louis in May, so don't share the answer. But the question is, what city was ranked the best work from home city in 2021 by PC Mag? Is it A, San Francisco, B, New York, C, San Antonio, or D, Ch Chattanooga? All right, we've got some A, we got Chattanooga, we got D's. Okay, a few more. I'm not seeing a lot of B's. Oh, there is one B, okay. All right, you have three, two, one. And all right, I'm sharing the answer and it is D, Chattanooga. All right, Chattanooga, Tennessee, also known as Gig City. Chattanooga is the first city in the country to roll out a city-wide fiber network in 2010. And during the pandemic, they were also able to provide free high-speed Wi-Fi to approximately 28, um, 28.5 students through their HCS Ed Connect program. Awesome. Thanks all for playing that fun little trivia. All right, so like I promised earlier at the, the beginning of the presentation, we will have resources for you. And here's a really good one. Um, we love creating toolkits for our community members when we see um, you know, what are the big gaps and struggles and conversations that, we, that they're having. So our awesome policy team, which thank you, Amy, so much for launching this, launched our affordable connectivity program page, um, which tells you everything you need to know. Um, it also covers information about how to apply for ACP, resources from the FCC, as well as my favorite section, the section where we answer frequently asked questions from our community. So some of those FAQs include citizenship status, um, outreach and enrollment assistance, eligible services and devices, and much more. So um, you will have access to that. This is These slides will be shared so you'll be, be able to access this page. Another um, resource that I want to highlight is the free and low cost internet plans page. So this was designed to be helpful for digital inclusion practitioners like yourselves, um, who may give guidance to clients and constituents on um, affordable internet in their area. We, we don't recommend to give this to actual folks who are looking for um, high speed internet. So this is perfect for um, librarians, digital navigators, and anybody who's assisting folks who need to find affordable internet in their area. All right, so our second solution to solving the digital divide is affordable and appropriate devices. All right, so each device has its strengths and weakness, and that all depends on what your community member needs. So that really just takes time in asking them what their interests are, um, kind of digging digging deeper. Sometimes they they know what they want, and other times that they they don't. So we're kind of going over some pros and cons in this little little uh, sheet I created. So mobile phones they're really great because they're portable. You know they're small. The mechanism to do, to charge them it's not that much any uh, not big and um, bulky. Um, so it really is mobile. It has a long battery life. Um, but it doesn't replace a laptop. So if you're going to be working from home or taking classes and the only device that that person has is a smartphone, that's not going to be enough. Um, it, imagine me doing this presentation through my smartphone. It's it's going to be, it would be a mess, right? Um, so if your main focus is using apps or light internet browsing, then this would be the perfect option. Now we have tablets. This is great for you know, binge watching stuff like Netflix and other entertainment, right? Uh, new Lord of the Rings show from Amazon came out, two episodes. So the, that's the perfect device for that. Um, they also have really long battery life. The touchscreen does provide more accessibility. You can use different languages on it, um, but it also might, in terms of accessibility, might also be difficult to learn um, just depending on what your mobility is. 
And um, unless you have a fancy cellular on it, a cellular plan on it, you're most likely not able to make calls. So there's there's that misconception of, you know, you have a tablet, why can't I make calls? Well, because they're not necessarily made for that unless you have that fancy um, cellular plan on top of it. And then lastly is a laptop, you know, your community member, if they're looking to work from home um, or, uh, remote learning, this is the perfect device for them. Large storage files. Um, it does have shorter battery life in terms of mobility. You got a big like chunky thing, right? In order to charge it and affordability wise, they are the most expensive out of the three. So when looking at the person's needs, it's worth exploring what they're wanting out of the internet and what they're hoping to do and then go from there. And um, in terms of a awesome organization doing this work, we have Computer Reach out in Pittsburgh. So they make, um, they provide refurbished devices as well as computer, computer literacy training and support for their community members. And an awesome uh, resource for you all is the Startup Manual, which we will hopefully have a version, a newer version later um, throughout the year. So in here, you can talk about, uh, you'll learn more about what it takes to build a community digital inclusion program. We have a checklist, for example, if you're, you know, somebody's wanting to do digital literacy trainings, you know, some questions to think about, like, where will your training happen? Who will be attending the training? Who will be facilitating the training? How will you pay for it? Things like that. And then the last skill I'll cover is digital skills training. So if folks have access to reliable internet and the appropriate device. That last missing piece is those skills. So the Essential Digital Skills Framework, it's a framework that we at NDIA recommend when breaking down the building blocks of digital skills. So here are some examples of um, what those foundational skills looks like. You know, you can turn on your device, you could turn it on and off, you know what the, the buttons are, right, you know, on your on your phone, you know what the, the right button does, it puts your screen to sleep, you know how to um, increase and decrease the volume, turn your phone on to silent, um, so you know what those different controls mean, you know how to connect your device to Wi-Fi, to the internet, you can update and change your password when you're prompted to do so, you know what your home screen looks like, you know how to get back to your home screen, um, you know how to edit your home screen. And um, the, those are the, the type of foundational skills. And one example, well, one type of organization that does really great uh, digital skills training are librarians. And um, one specific one is the Salt Lake City Public Library. They have this awesome program called the Tech League in which community members receive one-to-one -one tech assistance. All right. And as far as NDAA resources go, we have a blog post called Five Digital Literacy Resources You Need to Know About. This is written by our awesome program manager, Lo. They are they um, worked in libraries, so they have that experience of providing you know, some digital skills to patrons at the library. So there are resources here that are great for multilingual um, digital skills trainings, as well as different types of ones. So perfect for like Tech Boomers is perfect for that holistic approach, as well as Mozilla Foundation is great for um, trainings for facilitators as well. All right, two more things and then I'll pass it over to Amy. So we've got the digital navigators. If you've heard this term before, Awesome. If not, digital navigators are individuals who address the whole digital inclusion process, such as home connectivity, devices, and digital skills. And that's repeated interactions with that community member. Um, so they're trained to assess the community member's needs and completely guide them towards resources that are suitable for their skill level and lifestyle. So these digital navigators are gonna be the ones to, for example, use that tool that I discussed earlier of free and low cost internet. So this, uh, the digital navigator model was developed as a result of COVID from organizations and entities that needed to continue to serve their community members in a socially distant time. So here is the work that digital navigators do. Um, they provide the, those digital skills training, again, that one-on-one -on -one interaction, continuous interaction. Um, it could also be classes. Um, they also provide access to appropriate devices, so telling them where the low-cost refurbishers are in their community, as well as 
um, assisting them with finding low and um, low cost and affordable internet. So helping them like through their ACP application um, and, and then also showing them the different types of affordable internet options that are in their area. An example of this is with the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Um, Erica Camacho and John Torres, they're actually awarded the Benton Digital Equity Champions um, uh, for their work on digital inclusion project, which is centered around smartphone based digital skills for accessing mental health services. So their doors program, it's a series of interactive lessons designed to help patients develop new functional skills for accessing and utilizing their digital health. So some examples of how their digital navigators work um, is providing a basic understanding of how to use their smartphones and tools, um, basic technology troubleshooting, you know, how to fix internet connection, um, how to adjust or even put notification on your phone, if that's something that you want, um, how to address lack of storage space and Bluetooth connection. And our awesome digital navigation, digital navigator resources is our dedicated digital navigator resource page. So um, here we have a webinar that's talking about the digital navigator model. Um, it provides digital navigator resources like a baseline to a digital navigator job description, an intake form, a skills assessment so you know where the patron is at and um, where, where you can meet them, a follow-up survey, as well as tips for digital navigators on applying for ACP. And then lastly, we have coalitions. So digital inclusion coalitions. You all are not alone in this work. Um, and digital inclusion coalitions are uh, a great example of that. So these are a collective of community organizations that share the common concern for digital inclusion. So that includes local governments, libraries, education institutions, housing authorities, workforce developments, sometimes internet service providers, um, tech, tech companies, as well as other social services like housing authorities um, and civic organizations, to name a few. So they are a collective of organizations that help advocate for digital equity. So um, coalitions can help with raise funding for digital inclusion programs. It also helps with building political support for public investment in digital inclusion program. And most importantly, they bring awareness about digital inequities and the impact it has in our communities. So the map on the right, it's a map of the digital inclusion coalitions that has registered itself at NDIA. The green represents statewide coalitions and the red are red circles are local coalitions. Um, and we've got the Chicago Digital Equity Co Chicago Digital Equity Council there. All right, here is a just brief breakdown of the role of the coalitions. Again, they provide the advocacy of advocating for digital equity in your community, the alignment effect of connecting all these different organizations towards the same goal of providing digital equity in their community, and then that networking. There are different types of coalitions that exist out there, just depending on what their focus is. It could be topic focused. So let's say a coalition is only focusing on digital literacy skills. A coalition can only could also just primarily focus on geography. So um, if it's primarily, it could be focusing on tribe or that region. Um, they could also be focusing on a specific population. So the coalition could be focusing on older adults or students as well as a certain type of advocacy. So some, some coalitions exist for, for providing data in their, in their advocacy form. So um, also providing awareness through policy and funding as well. And these are folks, um, organizations that are usually involved in coalitions, so nonprofits, libraries, housing authorities. All right, an awesome example of an, a, a coalition is the Digital Inclusion Network of Portland. Um, there are over 45 organizational members and they help guide the city's digital equity action plan. All right, before I pass it over to Amy, this is the last thing I'll talk about. It's the coalition guidebook. So um, we developed this guidebook, it's new. Actually, we launched it in February of this year. So we got it from an input of 35 coalition leaders representing over 20 digital inclusion coalitions across the country. So it's jam packed with information about how coalitions are formed, what their structures are, best practices of digital inclusion off the ground, as well as how coalitions adapt over time. All right, passing it over to Amy to talk about policy. Thank you, Pamela. Isn't she wonderful, y'all? 
she's really like the best workshop and facilitator we have. And so I'm so excited to be here with her today to get to do this with all of you. And um, I'm really excited to see you all um, and get to talk a little bit about this really unique uh, and exciting moment that we're in. Matt alluded to this at the top of the hour that we are just in an unprecedented, unprecedented time in terms of broadband and digital inclusion. Um, I've worked in this field for over a decade and I've never seen anything like it. So it's a really exciting time. So first I'll just wanna like go through what was in the Infrastructure Act in terms of funding and opportunities for broadband. And then we'll talk a little bit more about some specific uh, things that are coming up that, again, that Matt alluded to that um, you all should be a know, in the know about so that you can get involved. So last year, President Biden signed into law the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act, um, commonly referred to as BILL or IIJA or IJA, <laughs> lots of different ways you can refer to this act. But in the Infrastructure Act, there was 65 billion set aside for broadband. And within that broadband section, there were multiple different uh, programs and different types of uh, uh, projects that were funded. So the first and what we're, we at NDIA are extremely excited about and have um, uh, been working on a lot is the Digital Equity Act. And there was 2.75 billion set aside for that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. There's also the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program. There's, that was the lion's share of this funding, 42.5 billion. And that really is to get at that unserved and underserved uh, locations across the country. I know in the jam board activity, many of you highlighted that in rural areas of Illinois, that there's not service because there's just not service, right? The BEAD program as it will as commonly referred to, its acronym is BEAD. Um, it will help solve that rural access problem and also will also provide some other funding or additional funds for uh, connecting community anchor institutions and things of that nature. And then I saw on the GM board that some of you are already familiar with the affordable connectivity program. There was 4.2 billion set aside for that and that's run and managed by the Federal Communications Commission and that is that um, provides a discount for low-income households so they can access it and uh, afford broadband in their home. Then there's a tribal connectivity program, $2 billion for that. There, that was actually established during one of the COVID relief bills, um, but they added additional funds to it because it was there's such a high need for tribal connectivity. Um, so they added $2 billion onto that. There's a middle mile program, $1 billion for that. And then importantly, you know, Pamela talked about digital discrimination and redlining, digital redlining. Um, Congress recognized that in the Infrastructure Act, and they actually uh, authorized and mandated that the Federal Communications Commission, um, within a two years time of the act's passing, um, that, that the FCC create some laws around that to make sure that internet service providers don't engage in discriminatory practices. And so they're in the middle of that rulemaking process right now. Next slide, please. So the Digital Equity Act actually has three programs, or two programs and three grants. So uh, the two programs are the State Digital Equity Capacity Grant Program and the Digital Equity Competitive Grant Program. The Capacity Grant Program is the one that's split into two grants. So there's a planning grant, and then there's an implementation grant. And the capacity grant program is for states, territories, um, and tribal organizations. And basically what it is, it's uh, block grants to states. And so um, what it is, uh, all states and uh, territories um, first have to create a digital equity plan. And then once they create the plan, then they uh, are eligible for the capacity grant, which is basically an implementation grant. And the capacity grant will help uh, fund the implementation of the digital equity plan. The competitive grants are for any individual organization across the country. So that could be, um, it could be a library, it could be a school, it could be a community-based organization, um, it could be an extension office. So um, those will be competitive and there's funding set aside for that. Um, and those uh, organizations will apply directly to NTIA for the funds. NTIA is the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. 
they are the ones um, out of the U.S. Department of Commerce that are administrating 48 out of the $65 billion for um, the six, uh, Infrastructure Act. Next slide, please. So the BEAD program, as we talked about, is again, 42.45 billion is set aside for this. Um, it again is block grants to states for broadband deployment to unserved and underserved areas. Um, in addition, once states have uh, hit their unserved and underserved areas, they can use those funds to connect community anchor institutions, which those are libraries, schools, health clinics, and I believe public housing. Um, then they can also use it for broadband adoption purposes. So we're excited about that. Um, we anticipate to see some states, particularly on the East Coast, so smaller, smaller states, um, you not you uh, have additional funds left over from deployment and actually use them for broadband adoption. So we're excited to see that. Um, and in uh, the BEAD program, states are considered the 50 contiguous states or 48 contiguous states plus Hawaii and Alaska. Um, Puerto Rico is considered a state in the, in the other territories in the District of Columbia. Next slide, please. So the Affordable Connectivity Program uh, is administered by the Federal Communications Commission. It's a follow on to the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, which was established under the Consolidated Appropriations Act in 2020. I think <laughs> I, um, from about 2019 till now, the years are a blur, y'all. I know you feel the same. And so I can never quite get the years right. Actually, it would take me a minute to figure out what year it is right now if I had to. 2022, that's right. Um, so it's $14.2 billion, as we noted, um, and that's $30 a month off of your internet bill for low-income households. Um, the, the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program was $50 a month. The um, uh, affordable connectivity program made a couple of key changes to the emergency broadband benefit program. One of them was reducing that subsidy amount from $50 to $30. It also extended um, some consumer protections and made a couple of other key changes that actually I'll talk about in a moment. Next slide, please. And one of those key changes was that it gave the Federal Communications Commission the authority to create a grant program for community-based organizations and governmental and non-governmental organizations to actually do the outreach and engagement around the Affordable Connectivity Program. Because what we know and what we found through a ton of research since the pandemic and before is that um, residents don't trust <laughs> the government. And they don't trust internet service providers. And so it's really important that the information get to the people on the ground through those trusted messengers. And so the affordable connectivity program, where we've seen a lot of outreach and engagement from the like local community-based organizations, um, whether that's a nonprofit, a school, a church, a, 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 any, anyone that's doing that outreach, at the local level that already has that established relationship, we've seen an uptick in registrations and with uh, participation in the program. And so um, the FCC, the Congress acknowledged that in the Infrastructure Act, which was the first one, uh, but they didn't give the FCC any money to do it. But the FCC saw it as super important themselves. And so what they did is they set aside $100 million for this program. And it's called the Affordable Connectivity Program Outreach Program. <laughs> I know there's program in it twice. Don't, don't add me. It's the FCC's call. And the goal of that is to increase awareness of and participation in the ACP among eligible households. And its objectives are both to support diverse outreach efforts, also to strengthen outreach partners, Increase enrollment among under and increase enrollment ACP among underrepresented and underserved households. And so what they'll do is they'll give out small grants to community-based organizations. Again, they could be governmental or non-governmental organizations across the country um, to do that outreach and engagement around the affordable connectivity program. So we're super excited about that. Um, the FCC just recently uh, uh, published a report and order around this. Um, but they have yet to publish a notice of funding opportunity, which is their next step. Once they publish that, then the grants will be live and people can apply for them and they'll have to have at least a 24 day window in order to apply. And I believe next slide, please. I think that might be it. Yep, and so there'll be a hundred million. Um, it'll be awarded over five years, but it's likely to be front loaded um, and governmental and non-governmental entities are eligible. Next slide. 
we've uh, compiled several resources for you all um, and they're here in the slide and the slides will be made available so you can access them. So we have um, we have a whole series we did explaining the Digital Equity Act and be notice of funding opportunities. Um, we also have a webinar that we did as well. We have a like Pamela noted before a ton of resources around the affordable activity program uh, if you would like to learn more. Next slide. And with that, I will pass it back to Pamela to tell you about how to join our community. Yes. Um, yep. This is basically wrapping it up. So if you would love to join our community, get access to these conversations that are constantly happening around ACP, um, digital skills, digital navigator resources, etc. Um, you can join our community for free. You can join as a friend or an affiliate. Those are free options. Um, there you'll get access to the listserv as well as joining our monthly community calls. Um, and then we also have paid um, membership opportunities for um, a corporate sponsors for those for-profit organizations, as well as Affiliate Plus, where um, the fee is prorated based on the, but the annual budget, but you do get access to an additional monthly call, um, and there you get access to speaking with our executive director, Angela. And then next up, we have our net inclusion. So it's going to be in San Antonio next year from February 28th to March 2. It's going to, we're going to have a lot of awesome workshops and guest speakers there to talk more about digital equity stuff. We do also have all of our recordings from our 2022 um, conference, which was in Portland this year. Um, so you can watch all of those recordings on the YouTube page, on our uh, NDIA YouTube. I'll put that in the link for you all to watch as well. But there's some pretty awesome recordings on there. For example, topics like digital inclusion, the correction systems and returning residents, um, a lot of good workshops on policy and funding, um, what partnering with internet service providers look like, et cetera. So I want to um, thank you all for having us. And definitely I want to put some time for uh, the, the question and answers. Thank you so much, Pamela, and thank you, Amy, as well. Um, we're really, there's a lot of um, points you've both made today and lots of really important information for us to take and kind of think over and think about approaches. And it's a really, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to have you here today. A uh, really good thing for us all to, to be thinking about this in our communities. And so there were some questions um, that came up during the presentation. Um, I've also uh, wanted to just uh, encourage participants to enter their questions into the chat space um, and I'll uh, get started with some of those. So early on, there was a, a question on, um, you know, you were, you were uh, Pamela, you were talking about um, all of the different varying digital skills and how access might not be access for some uh, based on um, those unique situations that sometimes you know, involve physical environment or just, um, you know, immediate uh, uh, situations or um, overall, um, overall situations that uh, different folks are, are in, as well as um, possible demographics that um, are at risk to be, you know, in that digital divide for various reasons. And um, there was a question that came across on what, um, how would one relate to IT service businesses or working with or relating to internet service providers as well? So in the idea of, um, you know, along those lines, do you have any sort of um, best practice or resource on that aspect of doing digital equity work and digital inclusion work in communities? Um. And I'll also pass it to Amy if you have any suggestions for that, but I, I don't have like a prescriptive response for that. Um, I think it really does depend on your community um, as well as the relationship that internet service providers have with your community, um, especially if you're a smaller one um, and your community has a really bad experience with more larger ISPs um, that can create distrust when um, you know a smaller ISP who wants to do digital equity work comes in, um, there might be some trust building there. So um, as far as models, I know that there are coalitions that exist that do have ISPs on like their committee um, or they have them kind of just 
be there as members. Uh, so I, I don't know specifically at the top of my head which of those coalition, um, digital inclusion coalitions exist where they do have ISPs on board, but I would recommend, um, you know, reaching out if there's a coalition that's near you, see if you can start building trust that way. Um, but uh, I, yeah, that's kind of all I have. Amy, do you have any suggestion? Yeah, I would just say in coalition building um, that, you know, uh, many of our coalitions do it differently. So in some places, internet service providers are part of the coalition, and some they're actually separate. And so, but the coalition will meet with them separately. Um, I do encourage, um, uh, if you are looking to start a coalition to look at all the models and see what best fits your community, um, but to be cognizant of, um, to make sure you have a plan for how you will interact with your internet service providers. You don't necessarily have to have them as a full member of the coalition if you don't think that's the best scenario for your community. Thank you. Um, and another question came in uh, to me. Uh, can you elaborate how Chattanooga got high speed internet to almost 30,000 students? Do you think because you had mentioned they they got fiber in 2010, um, so that was way before the pandemic. But do you think that fiber is the number one reason they were able to do that? And they because they were ready for the future. Um, do you feel they were able to close any other digital divides around there? Or do you have any more about that story um, to to whether fiber was the, the main role in them being able to give ubiquitous access to their student population. Uh, Amy, do you have any information on that? Oh. Yeah, so what I would say, it's not necessarily that it's the fiber that was the solution that got to the 30,000 students and closed the digital divide. The technology is important, of course, but it was the mechanism for getting it to the households that's more important. So Chattanooga is a municipally run and owned network. Um, I actually, Matt would have to chime in here. I don't know if that's legal or actually Robbie probably knows too, if that's legal or not in Illinois. It's legal um, in Illinois. It's legal in Illinois. Okay, then what I would say is that Chattanooga is a great example of, um, of, of what communities can do when they coalesce around this issue and make it a priority. So that's what happened in Chattanooga is that it was that it was made a priority. It was there was leadership behind it, funding behind it that then made sure that people across the, the, the community were served. And they went through a lot of different iterations of making that happen. Um, they've got a great a ton of partners across the city working together to, to make that happen um, and 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 so that's what, what i would highlight and um i know the folks there would be happy to talk with you and andy burke who was the mayor during the time that this was all happening is now at ntia and he's part of the leadership that's um, implementing the infrastructure act so if that tells you anything um his leadership was really pivotal in making sure that that the whole community was served. Thank you. A couple more questions here. And of course, that was very helpful. Um, gets us thinking about, you know, what are those approach those approaches for partnerships and and certain models for, um, you know, whether you're you're going to want to serve to um, run access in, in such a ubiquitous way. Thank you. Um, how would, uh, oh, so then we, ha we have another question. Are there any specific training programs specifically for seniors and people with disabilities that don't have any digital skills, may not currently have internet access, yet desire to learn and or gain access? Yes, um, I, I saw that in the chat. Kayla, thank you for asking that. So I did put um, Tech Boomers in the chat. That that was one of the organizations in our resources during the presentation. Um, there is also Cyber Seniors. I'll put that. Thank you. So those resources will also be included when I send the follow up email. We have some people listening, you know, maybe on their phone or something. So um, thank you for for reiterating the responses. Um, yeah. Um, and I, I put resources 
specifically for um, senior citizens. However, let me um, dig into our affiliate list because we have over 850 affiliates. So I can put more of a comprehensive list for resources for seniors and people with disabilities, Keila, and then I can send it over to you, Nancy, then you can share with everybody. That can would I, be wonderful. Can I just jump in real quick? One thing we didn't talk about where it was in the state to do equity plans. Um, states will be required to provide an asset inventory, so a list of all the different types of organizations that are serving what they call, what Congress calls covered populations, and covered populations, there's seven categories of these different types of populations, and seniors are one of them. So when Illinois and Matt leads this process, goes through the digital equity planning process, Matt and his team will undergo an asset inventory process where they'll need to identify the resources throughout the state that are providing digital literacy, digital skills, and all sorts of different types of programs for seniors and veterans and low-income populations and minority households and all the others. And so what I would encourage you all is if you know any of these things, to let Matt know, to let Matt and his team know, and to be engaged in that process so you can bring to light the different types of organizations across the state that are already doing this work. If you're doing this work, chime in, right? Like let him know so that as he's conducting that asset inventory, um, it's, it's as comprehensive as possible. Thank you so much for mentioning that. I know that there are folks on here that are engaged in various ways. And so um, for, for, you know, all of us, no matter what we're doing in this regard to, to think about that and know that we can, you know, put that, put forth those suggestions and um, comments to a place uh, would, would um, is very helpful. And of course, Matt will be CC'd on that follow-up information too. And you'll get um, those, that contact information for, for Matt and our two presenters today. So this is all very good. And of course, I assume, you know, if you do get any questions from communities after this, um, are you opposed to, um, to, to receiving questions via email, for example? No, not at all. Um, our email, I can put it in the chat. Um, it's also on our website. Um, let me put the email in the chat. But yes, please feel free to reach out to Amy or I. Um, I am the perfect person to reach out to, though. Um, so if there's any questions you have, I can direct you to the appropriate staff person. That's so great. Um, it's great to have the National Digital Inclu Inclusion Alliance as a, you know, a main um, partner and pres uh, collaborator and presenter today uh, with us. Um, I love that people can know you all exist and you have an amazing website with just tons of resources. So we'll be really um, definitely uh, making sure that that will be also shared on the, the follow-up email. Uh, we had a question. There's a poll there for if you uh, felt you learned something today, right? If you learned several things about uh, today's topic. And thanks for getting back to us on that. Thank you, Mike. Another question about the, the coalition in Chicago. And you had answered that in the chat, pa uh, Pamela. And I'm really thankful for, for that connection because we are always looking for good models as well. Um, and so if you have some other ideas for models as well, uh, it's a wonderful thing to include that uh, for some of our communities today if you if anything comes to mind uh, so that um, the link to the coalition in Chicago is there in the chat um, what was the the proper name of that Chicago coalition working in digital equity yeah it's Chicago Digital Equity Council Chicago Digital Equity Council thank you um, we had another question come in about um, people with disabilities and those digital inclusion and digital literacy resources and wanted you to comment on, on that more broadly. Yeah, so we will um, put together a list of the um, uh, senior as well as people with like uh, digital, I'm sorry, digital literacy trainings for both of those communities. Um, I'll, I wanna make sure I put together a comprehensive list instead of just kind of putting it in the chat of what those that come into my head because we do have over 850 affiliates so I'm going to go through them and then send you um, Nancy an email which then she'll share with everybody those resources. Thank you we we did get another question in um, and thanks for staying on we will probably um, wind it down in another five minutes or so but we have a uh, time maybe for two more questions. Um, 
So in very rural areas like ours, the difficulties of obtaining and maintaining a serviceable internet connection often precludes the need for devices or skills. What are the best financial resources to help very rural communities bring connectivity to households in need to help push forward equity? So that's going to be the BEAD program that we talked about, which is the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program. Or there are actually, we didn't even get into, but um, there were several COVID relief bills that provided additional funds for broadband deployment um, for rural areas across the country. Um, one of which was through the American Rescue Plan Act. And um, in, that, in that act, there was a, a $10 billion fund that was set aside called the Capital Projects Fund. It's being administered by the Treasury Department. And it's again, it's block grants to states. And so um, Illinois will get some sort of pot of funding at the amount I actually don't know. Um, and then they'll determine how to best spend that based on um, where the unserved and underserved areas are across the state, also in making sure they're in line with Treasury's guidelines. So that funding is a, will be available probably by the end of this year, depending on submissions and whatnot, or planning submissions and whatnot. And then the, the bead funds, the, the states first to before they can access those funds, that again, that's that $42.5 billion pot of funds. Um, before they can access those funds, the, the states have to go through a, um, a planning process as well, a 270 day planning process um, where they create a five-year action plan. Once they create a five-year action plan, then they'll have a plan for, again, where to deploy the funds. Um, so the, the in, in short, or in long, actually, that was a long-winded answer, Todd, but <laughs> to answer your question, the funding is coming for those rural areas. It's push, it's coming, it's just, it's, you won't see it quite yet. Thank you so much, Amy. We have another question, uh, where to find funding for affordable housing cooperatives for abled or disabled members to give digital access and skills to its members? Is, is there anything like that you can, um, you can remark uh, of a model scene or a resource or um, any, any type of comment you have for that? So I would, I would actually encourage folks to think about um, the Digital Equity Act as a potential source of funds for these types of programs. So again, the states need to go first through that year-long planning process, and then the states will determine how best to spend their funds. And that could be sub-awards out. To, to projects like that. Um, so, so that could be one form of funding. And then again, there's those competitive awards for the Digital Equity Act funds. The FCC, in addition, the FCC also has, um, we talked a little bit about that outreach grant program they're about to launch. They're also about to launch a pilot program for um, federal public housing authorities or anyone that works in public housing to do ACP outreach and um, enrollment. And so if that's something that um, the, the folks in your community are interested in that, I'd encourage you to look for that, um, that pilot program opportunity. Um, well, we expect to see a, um, hold on, I'll remember the name of this in a second. A public notice, we expect to see a public notice uh, come out in the next month or two around that. And then so that would be an opportunity. Now, the FCC will only select 20 places across the country, but um, that would be an opportunity as well. Um, and in addition, um, there's, you know, I'm, I'm talking primarily about federal resources, right? Um, I'd encourage you all to be creative, right? Look to your state. Are, does your state have funding left from the Afford um, American Rescue Plan Act? Um, does your local community have funding through foundations or your local government or places like that? So, so get creative um, in the meantime while you're waiting on federal funds. Thank you so much, Amy. Did you have anything um, to add, Pamela? Uh, no, Amy answered it perfectly. 
And I think that we're, um, you know, at the conclusion of the question and answer. However, I want to just say to Amy and Pamela, I always like to take um, some thoughts from you at the end, you know, to to talk to folks who are still on the line, and you know, give them some takeaways. There, you've given us so many good things to think about, and um, also some great news, uh, so that we can, you know, start to plan, which will be very important. Um, and so, uh, any lasting sort of takeaways for um, those on the call today? Yeah, I can go first. Um, my takeaway is that you're not alone in this work. And NDIA, you know, we've created a space for folks like you all um, who care about your community, who care about digital inclusion in your community to connect with other folks doing the same thing. And you might be able to learn from them um, both the struggles that they're dealing with as well as success and resources so really encourage you all to join the community for that and i would just say um to get involved in the state planning processes that are about to launch um there is a lot that you all bring to the table and a lot that the state needs to hear from you in terms of what assets you have in your community, what knowledge, what needs you're seeing amongst the different community members that you engage with. And so I just, and, and uh, your state government needs your help. There's, there's a lot of work to be done in the next year to gear up for deploying these federal funds. And so I would really encourage you to get involved in that process. Thank you so much. And we did have one more question come through. What are NDIA relations by local coalitions and school health library broadband coalition local and state members? So we're, um, we are uh, a member of Shelby. Shelby is a member of our community. Our executive director is on Shelby's board and their executive director is on our board. So we are close partners and allies. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for coming to today's presentation. Uh, wonderful uh, presenters today. I really thank you so much for your time and your expertise and all you do, uh, seen and unseen, right? So thank you so much. And we hope you'll come back uh, and talk to us in Illinois again soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.